happy Halloween. I hope you're having a very unafraid and happy Halloween. We're exploring this book, How to Live with Courage and Hope in Uncertain Times. In all stages of life, we're looking at the top fears of Americans here in worship at small groups, and we're enjoying the feeling of being unafraid on this holiday week. My name is Matt. I'm the pastor at United Church here online in Bath and Gunnisonville. I'm good with the masks and everything in Halloween, but here we'd just like you to know that you're welcome online or in person just the way you are, the real you, no pretenses. In fact, we try to shed those masks, the false fronts that some that we carry around from time to time. We don't pretend that we're perfect people because we're part of a group of people that's called the church. What we are is people being and becoming ourselves more and more, encouraging each other to become the best ourselves we can be and enjoying the journey together. So be yourself. Let us know who you are, where you're watching from. The easiest way to do that is click on the Connect With Us button. A little form pops up and you'll have the opportunity to give us a prayer request, ask for any information, and we'll respond with just a personal note of welcome. While you're finding that button, and before we jump into a song to begin exploring our topic today, we're going to pray together, and I want to encourage you to get a hold of a, uh, of a candle around your house, and we'll light that together as we get started. We're going to remember that we are not alone. <laughs> we're going to try to find some good matches. We're going to remember that we are not alone as we meet together today. We're, we're together, but we're also uh, with God, and God is here. God's the light of the world, and our creator, sustainer, and the one who cares for us every day. So will you pray with me? God, we are so grateful that you are here today. You were here before we were. We're just reminding ourselves of your presence. And to get our heads in the right space, we take just a minute to put everything else in our lives, our busyness, our schedules, our worries, what we're having for lunch, the stress of the day, put that all behind us. We want not only be, to be here just physically, but to be present in this moment and to be open to you. So we center our thoughts, we open our minds and our hearts and our spirits to you. And we pause and remember that no matter what else is going on, there is so much to be thankful for, to be grateful for. And this day we are just grateful that you've created us, allowed us to live in this world, sustained us, called us your children. And we pray for each other today. We know that there are lots of needs and the people around us, so we take just a moment to pray specifically for the needs in people's lives that we know of right now. We pray for those people who need a touch from you. We lift them up in our minds right now to you. Now, God, meet each one of us here and all of us together. Give us what we need to find the way of life in its fullness the way of life that we can be a blessing to others. Many of us are giving to this church financially, and we bring a portion of what you've given us and dedicate it to you as we give to this church this week. Teach us, continue to teach us to be generous and to give with grateful hearts. We thank you for the opportunity to direct our heart with our giving, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to share with you uh, why this song is special to me, I've always struggled in my faith with how do you love God? It's obvious how you love your neighbor. But Jesus said loving God and loving your neighbor summarizes the entire scripture and uh, summarizes all the commandments at least. So how do you love God? And for me, it's two things, gratitude and humility. And I think for me, this song sum sums that up nicely. I have squandered away, bended low from the weight I was under. And many is the time I have spent on worried mind while living in a world of wonder. 
I have trouble, my soul, doing things I can't control. Awaiting my next foolish blunder. And I try to tell myself it's in the hands of someone else while living in. Up above the dark and clouds, there's a light to be found. High above the lightning and the thunder. Oh Lord, hear my plea. Won't you help my eyes to see that I am living? I once had a friend And he loved life to the end And he never let his faith go asunder Though he lost his worldly due He could smile and say to you Man, I'm living in a world of wonder Up above the dark and clouds there's a light to be found High above the lightning and the thunder Oh Lord, hear my plea Won't you help my eyes to see That I am living in a world of wonder I am living You are we are living in a world of wonder Good morning, I'm Kathy Hunt and I just want to remind you that even though the crop walk season ended on October 10th, we're still accepting donations through October 31st. The crop walk raises money for Church World Services this organization can stretch the funds we raise to do so much to help so many in need around the world and right here in our community. I hope you'll consider donating to this very worthy cause. You'll be doing a world of good. Just go to unitedch.com, scroll down until you see the crop walk sign. You can donate online or you'll also find addresses for mailing a donation if you'd rather not contribute online. If you do mail a check, please make sure it's written out to CROP. If you have any questions at all, just see Shirley at the Bath Church or me at Gunnisonville. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Hi, I'm Deb Lishy, and it's my joy to lead you in the Lord's Prayer. Will you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Sue Hensley and I am honored to read to you Psalm 46 selected verses. God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart, when the mountains crumble into the center of the sea. Nations roar, kingdoms crumble. God utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of heavenly forces is with us. The God of Jacob is our place of safety. Be still and know that I am God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I have this kind of love-hate relationship with the news. Maybe you do too. I love knowing about what's going on in the world and hearing about it, but I hate that this overwhelming feeling of everything is, everything's bad. I have a friend who was watching the, the news, and he has about a 10-year-old boy. His boy was just kind of overhearing, watching him watch the news. And at a break, in the beginning of the news, he turned to his dad and said, the world is ending. And, and I thought, that's how appropriate that is. Today, I'm ready for a, a children's time at church with this little book called Chicken Little. I don't know if you remember it. You remember that book that an acorn falls from a tree and hits Chicken Little on the head. And Chicken Little says, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And he goes and tells Henny Penny, who tells Lucy Goosey, and then they tell Turkey Lurkey and Foxy Loxy. And they end up in a den, I think. They were afraid of things that they didn't really understand. And the book highlights the hysteria that can follow along and its consequences. And it's a great story. By the way, the first telling of that story goes back 2,500 years, and it was the, the Buddha telling the story. But it wasn't a chicken or a hen. It was actually a bunny who felt the world is collapsing. And he kept telling his friends, the world is collapsing. And they created this mass hysteria and the ramifications of that. There's a lot to be mined from that story about what we should be afraid of and what we shouldn't be afraid of. But it's helpful to remember that most of our fears, I remember this, false events appearing real. Now there are legitimate fears and we need to evaluate those real threats like Foxy Loxy and then realize which ones are false events appearing real, like the sky is falling. Well, the challenge, as it is with engaging with the news, is that it can feel like the sky is falling right now. As a pastor, I get asked sometimes about biblical prophecy and whether this is the end times or not. And You know, fear sells, and fear and religion, the end times, sells even more. Each new global disaster leads to a series of religious claims about the end times. And then throw in some politics, and you have a religion mixed with fear. And let me be clear, this is a problem, and religion and fear don't mix well. For some reason, the followers of Jesus, the very people who should be the least afraid, can be among the easiest to stir up in fear. Ah! I don't know what's up with that, but fear sells, partly because we have fear built into us as a human standard equipment, right? It's a blessing. It's a great thing. But in this century, more often than not, we are afraid when we really shouldn't be. And that brings me to a question. Where can you feel the emotion like the sky is falling right now? Talk about that for a minute. We're continuing our series today called Unafraid. Next week, we're going to talk about sickness, growing old, and death. Today, we're talking about the sky is falling. As we approach this topic of the sky is falling, I'm walking on a bit of a tightrope today. For many people, uh, especially those on the underside of power, 
the world is always much closer to ending, or at least not having a very positive quality of life. We are so amped up right now on fear that these conversations are hard to have. And you can see people failing to follow Jesus in the idea of loving those who we might call our enemies. So how do we stay motivated to look for wisdom, to take real action for justice and equality, while not demonizing those who need to be part of the conversation and the solution? Well, I want to refer to this today as our bedrock scripture. Here it is. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. And today's bedrock truth that we're getting out of that is even if the sky is falling, there are earthquakes, mountains crumbling into the sea, tsunamis, and all of that kind of thing, God is our refuge and our strength. We need to consume that truth, like really get it in us, to take it in. We need to let that settle into our hearts and use that truth to counteract the news that we're being bombarded with. Because the truth about what we consume is that if we consume a lot of fearful news, guess what? We become fearful. You may not think about this, but it's true that what we consume, we become. So if you're struggling with fear that the sky is falling, perhaps you need to consider what you're consuming. What's your news consumption? What are the things you're engaging in? Maybe you should take a step back from some of those things or even the people, or at least for a season. The truth is that unless you're the leader of a world superpower, you're not Atlas, holding the world on your shoulders by watching the daily news. Well, here's something that I'd like you to discuss too. Think about this for a second. How much news, traditional or online, do you consume and how much of it is negative or fearful? Talk about that for a moment. This series is based on content from the Church of the Resurrection. They did a survey that I mentioned last week. Now, the top fear they found for people over 50 is the direction of our country. And that's what we're talking about today when we say the sky is falling. Now, Chapman University does a poll, and they found these fears. The top fears of Americans in 2020 and 2021. First one is fear of government corruption. 79.6%, sixth year in a row that's been on the top. The second one is people I love dying. And the third fear is a loved one contracting COVID. Now that's, that's a bit crazy, isn't it? That we are more afraid of corruption than we are dying. Here's what researchers said at this university, that fears generally rise and fall with the news, what's being reported over and over on the news. And over the past three years, one party and the other is saying the other one is corrupt. That is what they say is driving this. One recent Gallup poll 
talked about the direction of our country, and it found that in January of 2020, 41% of the people were satisfied with the direction of our country. And in January of 2021, just a year later, 11% were satisfied. Ironically, at the same time, Gallup found that when it comes to the direction of our personal lives, January of 2020, 90% of the people were satisfied with the direction of their personal life. That's a new high. And a year uh, after that, January of 2021, 82% were satisfied. You see some irony there? Only 11% were satisfied with the direction of our country, but 82% we're still satisfied with the direction of their own lives. Now, that's a huge disconnect. Rick Warren, a political consultant and media strategist, says this about fear. Fear is the simplest emotion to tweak in a campaign ad. In 60 seconds, I can make you afraid or try to make you afraid and be relatively successful. You associate your opponent with terror, fear, crime, causing pain and uncertainty, and you have a strong chance in winning an election. Now, it doesn't matter which party, if you're afraid, you want protection. Well, we've talked about this fear a bit, and I want to hit the pause button for a second, because when it comes to the direction of our country, we are deeply divided, both as a country and even as Christians. What happens then is that people like me, pastors, well, we get stuck in the middle. Whenever I approach a thorny topic uh, like politics, you know what people are thinking, right? One person will think something like, hey, you don't talk about politics enough. And then the next person will talk to me and say, you talk about politics way too much. Well, let me just remind us all that we are a church, right? We're not a current events talk show. We're not in the news business. Now, we engage in current events, but that's because our faith comes to bear on our lives. And it's not disassociated with the way that we organize our life together, which is essentially what politics is about. At the same time, the truth of what we talk about is deeper than the current news cycle. We've been pretty successful at making space for each other's opinions in this church. Even though we do that, I occasionally have had someone tell me that they don't feel like their perspective is welcome here. And sometimes that's because of something that I've said or something that you all have said or posted on social media. That always pains me so much because I value diverse perspectives. So I wrestle together with all of you over this question, who's going to represent your voice if you're not here? So I want to encourage you not to be too afraid to have real conversations. Don't let each other become just two-dimensional based on a social media post. Sit down and talk with someone. Seek to understand. Here's a key. Just seek to understand more than being understood. Be curious about the other person and their views and let each other be full three-dimensional human beings, complex and nuanced and, and different. I want to encourage you to stick it out and to make a radical commitment to Christian community, even to people that you disagree with. Because listen, the defining mark of the Christian life isn't to be right. It isn't to be right ideologically or politically, our defining mark is love. Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Our love for one another is about both the decisions that we make as an individual, all of them, you know, our attitude and our tone and everything, and the decisions that we make together. I was reminded this week that in Jesus' group of followers, he had both Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector. Now, that might not mean a lot to you right now, but let me unpack that for just a moment. Because in the first century, if you talk about the greatest political divide in the first century, it was vast and it was between those who believed in accommodating the Romans and those who wanted to kill the Romans. So Matthew is a tax collector. He was a Jew who said, hey, the Romans are occupying our land. And we've just got to make the best of it. So I'm going to get along with them. And I'm going to figure out ways that I can bring some good things to the table with them. And so he decided he was going to collect taxes from them. And most of those people were cheats and lined their own pockets as well while they were taking money from the Jews and giving it to the Romans. And then you've got Simon, 
Simon was a part of the party of the Zealots. And the Zealots believed that it was incumbent upon the Jews to kick the Romans out of the Holy Land. Now, within the Zealots, there was a special group that took daggers. They had little daggers. They kept them in their thighs. And when they were in a crowded place and there was a Roman soldier, they would come up behind the Roman soldier and pull out their knife and, and cut their throats, trying to get rid of them, terrorize them. They were, the, they were the terrorists of their era. So you can see these two are so diametrically opposed. And yet Jesus called both of these men to be in the same group and be his followers. I can imagine that up to that point, there's no way these two would have been in the same room. And I'm guessing that both of their politics were changed by virtue of following Jesus. I'm also guessing that they had some serious discussions when Jesus wasn't around about politics. What that tells me is that the body of Christ, the church is made up of people who are on both the left and the right, liberals, conservative Democrats and Republicans, and maybe that's just the way God wants it to be. Well, I certainly value the diversity of our congregation. And that's part of what I love about this church. We're a bridge, you're a bridge, to a divided community. And you're modeling the fact that people who have different views can come together. And I think that makes us stronger and it makes our church even more important in this community. Now, there are several topics that could help us explore how we respond when we fear the direction of our country. And actually, I wish we had time to explore a few, and we'll get to some in, in due time. But today, I just want to pick up one of those controversial topics that's going to affect us right now. We're going to see several hundred Afghan families move into our area in the next short amount of time. Now, I'm happy to say that the church is really on top of this. Last week, I attended a webinar called Welcoming New Afghan Neighbors, How, a How-To for Local Churches. And I want to encourage you to watch this hour program. I'm sending you a link. It's in the program. It's right here on the screen. It's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash my refugee. Watching this webinar, you're going to learn a lot about what's really happening on the ground right now in our area. And you're going to learn about opportunities to be involved. I'm going to share with you right now a quick personal story from Youssef Sultani and Basir Sophie two young Afghan refugees who have organized a movement to help welcome and support their peers. Take a look. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yusuf Sultani, and I came here uh, 2016. Um, I came here as a refugee from uh, Indonesia, uh, but originally I'm from Afghanistan. I left Afghanistan when I was uh, 14 years old. And I spent two years in Indonesia to get resettled to come to the United States. Um, when I came here in 2016, I was in a group home um, I supported uh, from Samaritas um, organization. At the time, um, I was uh, really um, depressed or disconnected from people um, from back home or from my friend from Indonesia. Um, I couldn't connect with anyone. Uh, I was a struggling days and um, I was a struggling in the school. I was a struggling um, around the community and I couldn't make any connection with anyone with the culture barrier and language barrier um, and all of those. Uh, but I met someone, um, my, my foster mom, uh, she's also here, Judy Harris. Um, she helped me out. Um, I moved with her, which was really good. I started connecting with a lot of people and making connection and starting a new life. I uh, went to school. I went to Oak Miss High School. I graduated from Oak Miss High School 2019, and I started um, uh, college fall of 2019, and currently I am uh, in my third year at Western Michigan University, uh, majoring in film video media studies. Um, with the, the situation that happened in Afghanistan, um, I felt that I felt that I was uh, I have the responsibility and the ability to help my people 
Um, the way I went through, and I don't want them to go through here, and I want to be a resource for them. I want to be a mentor to help them out here, and I want them. Uh, I want to be uh, a welcoming uh, Afghan refugee that welcome <coughs> another refugee from Afghanistan. Um, I'm going to pass to Basir. Basir is going to talk about his story. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Basir Sophie. Uh, I'm also originally from Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, before everything, I would like to thank you, Judy, so much for everything she does. So I know Judy personally for about nine years, ever since I came to US, ever since they, she passionately helping the refugees resettle in Michigan. And that is, means a lot to us as refugee because we do understand the feeling when somebody, uh, someone help, try to help us. So thank you so much, Judy. So my story, uh, when I was, uh, uh, 10 years old, my family left Afghanistan. We left Afghanistan, came straight to Iran. So I lived in Iran for four years and in Iran, we, our opportunity was very limited for us. So I wasn't able to go to school. Uh, I wasn't able to have an easy job. So we were only allowed to have like the factory jobs and the jobs that were physically uh, hard for us. That's what we did. After four years, uh, when I get a little bit older, I realized that the here is not for me. So I left my family and I went to uh, illegally to Turkey. And uh, I stayed in Turkey for two years. And after that, I got accepted to United States after multiple interview, background check, everything. And then in 2013, uh, May 2013, I came to United States and uh, through a Samartis. Back then, it was a Lutheran social services, and uh, I came to the United States, and I lived with my foster mother, Gina. So at the beginning, when I arrived here, it was extremely difficult for us because uh, nobody was from Afghanistan was here. It was me and other Judy's foster son, Alex. So it was extremely hard for us to uh, adapt to the culture here, and, uh, and most often, I was missing uh, the culture of Afghanistan, the holiday, the celebration we did. So there was a supper but I was missing so much when, when those ties come, comes around and I, I was unable to celebrate those stuff. So yep. late, this, this past summer, uh, our friends came together and they, they suggested that we should create a community. And I was extremely passionate about it. I was happy, I was so excited. I, we all shared our idea to create the Afghan Association of Michigan. So. Uh, our, our main goal is to help the new arrival to help them with the resettlement here easily and then yeah, help preserve and uh, celebrate Afghan cultures. And then the recent events that happened in Afghanistan, the uh, U.S. troops tried to evacuate Afghanistan and this current situation happens. A lot of Afghan comes here and I do know that they need our help indeed. So that's why we created this organization and try to connect with multiple agencies to help these people resettle here. So it's one thing to talk about the refugee crisis, right? Or anything we fear, and it's quite another to meet this face-to-face -face and to get to know people. The thing we need to remember is what it means to be human, to have compassion, to have mercy. You've heard about the vetting process, but you can never guarantee fully, right, that we won't let someone into our country that has ill will planned. But the statistics should help us realize that it's much more probable, in fact, 4,000 times more likely that we'll be struck by lightning twice than be harmed by a refugee. So there are lots of ways to get into our country easier than faking that you're a refugee. But of course, you can never guarantee that. Now, the local refugee resettlement organization in our area is St. Vincent Catholic Charities. And here's a short clip from their resettlement director, Judy Harris. So yes, I'm the resettlement director at St. Vincent Catholic Charities in Lansing. But before I start, just on behalf of um, Bethany Christian Services and Samaritas, I just want to promote um, fostering refugee kids um, because, yeah, look at these guys, you know? I mean, it's the best thing I've ever done. So before I cry, I'm going to start um, my presentation. Now, you know, we've had this historic airlift of Afghans out of Afghanistan. There are over 60,000 Afghan evacuees that have arrived or will arrive. 
300 of those um, Afghans are projected to come to St. Vincent's. Um, it's, um, this is on top of the already projected 400 refugees. So you can see how we're going from 95 this year to 700 um, next year. And so that's how our graph looks now. So this is why we're um, a little bit in a panic. We are in the midst at this moment of what is being termed an avalanche. And this was a term of the Department of State, the US Department of State um, mentioned a couple of weeks ago that um, all of the resettlement agencies would start getting an avalanche of Afghans in October. So that's where we are. So in Lansing, this is as of last night and I've seen several travel booking notices today um, but we have resettled 49 as of last night and we had 48 more booked to travel. Um, when they reached out, when the Department of State reached out to all of the resettlement agencies and said, how many people can you take? And we all responded back with, you know, 300 in Lansing and 300 in um, Detroit and 400 in Grand Rapids or whatever we did. That ended up being um, 37,000 was the capacity and they have 60,000. So they're gonna ask us to pretty much double. So what we're doing right now is not resettlement. It's not resettlement as we've ever known it. This is an emergency operation. This is more like disaster relief. I hope that you and I have the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of these people. And maybe we can do that together. When our four children were in their teens, Lori and I took them to the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. We wanted them to experience and know that this had really happened. And in the museum, if you've been there, you go through a timeline, you walk through a timeline as Hitler is gaining power. And you see the treatment, the ghettos that are, uh, the Jews are forced to, and eventually you see a pile of shoes, uh, piles of hair, and some of, the, of some of the people that were slaughtered. It makes it really real. Now in 1938, Hundreds of thousands of Jews were beginning to understand what was going on in their country and were trying to flee. In 1938, an American public poll was taken and 67% of Americans said, we don't want the Jews coming here. In 1939, you may remember the SS St. Louis with 900 Jews desperate to get out of what was clearly becoming persecution and death for Jews. Here's a photo. They're on the boat and they landed in the port of Miami and Miami turned them away. They went back to Germany and many of them were killed. After World War II, when hundreds of thousands of Jews were seeking refuge, President Eisenhower proposed receiving 250,000 Jews in America. And Americans were really upset about this. 59% of Americans said, even after knowing what they had been through in the Holocaust, we don't want them coming here. In 1975, when I was a kid, it was the fall of Saigon and the Vietnamese boat children and their families who were seeking asylum. They were on boats just like the Afghans are today. And many Americans were not in favor of them coming, but the president and Congress said, this is too important. We have to take these people in. And we did, and many of you grew up with them. So the question is this, what would God have Christians think about refugees? In the scriptures, we find passages like this in Jeremiah 22, 3. The Lord proclaims, do what is just and right. Rescue the oppressed from the power of the oppressor. Don't exploit or mistreat the refugee, the orphan, and the widow. Jesus speaks about the last judgment, and here's how the last judgment goes down. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was sick and in prison. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. And as much as you did this for the least of these, you did it for me. You know, when I think about these things and the, the plight of the refugees, I also have the tapes playing in my head that maybe you do too of 9-11 of and this particular terrorist attack and that one. But now there's all these people and I have to decide whether my fear is what I will base my decisions on or something else. I've been thinking about this word Courage. Courage is the willingness to do what you know is right, even when you're afraid. Now, I believe and I hope that as Christians, we'll be courageous people, that we would have the courage to do what we know is right, even when it makes us afraid. You know, it's not really courage if it doesn't make you afraid. I was reminded this week of 
Harry Fosdick's great hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. The words say, from the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. Let's jump back to the fear of the direction of our country and the world around us. And I want to tell you that my peace does not come from who's living in the White House. My refuge and strength is not who's in Congress or what our immigration policy is. Now, those are important positions, important decisions. But with the writer in Psalm 46, I would say my peace comes from God. He is my refuge and strength. A help always near in times of trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart, when the mountains crumble into the center of the sea, nations roar, kingdoms crumble. God orders, his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of heavenly forces is with us. The God of Jacob is our place of safety. And so God says, be still and know that I am God. I don't know if you noticed that line, God is our refuge. That means in some sense, we're all refugees and our refuge and strength is God. We've lived through difficult times before. No matter what you're facing, it's time for us not to be people who are primarily driven by our fears, but instead to demonstrate our courage in the face of fear and do the things that we know are right. So I wanna encourage you to ask you to be people who love each other, are patient with each other, and gracious toward each other, even those with whom you disagree. So, is the sky falling? No, it is not. I don't think it is. Now, our government can make a big impact on people's lives, both positively and negatively, especially for those who live on the underside of power. And ultimately, peace doesn't come from our government. It doesn't come from those who are in the White House or in the Congress. So let's return one last time to the bedrock truth of what we're talking about this morning, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. And when you feel like the sky is falling, and especially when the sky is falling, certainly act justly. But also don't forget, be still and know that I am God. So let's do that right now. I'm going to lead you in a breath prayer. We're going to take a deep breath. And when we do, I want you to say in your head, be still and know. And then when we breathe out, you can finish that by saying that I am God. Okay, it's be still and know that I am God. Let's do it together. Take a deep breath in and think, be still and know. And then breathe out that I am God. Let's do that again. Breathe in a deep breath, be still and know that I am God. Amen. It's been so good to be with you today. I want to leave you with a couple of next steps. Look at the refugee webinar, the links in the program and on the website. Um, maybe another idea would be this, turn off the news this week, or at least some of the time. And then a third idea, how about spend some time meditating on Psalm 46. Now take that breath prayer with you and use that this week. And I want to leave you with this blessing. God be with you. God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>